my mom came up last day with me this morning, so she just got a little bug. But anything else we can pray for? Anybody have a, have a need? Yeah. I'd like to pray for my father, Tom Okay. Okay, pray for Tom. Anything else we can pray for? Anything you want to brag on God for this week? Any, any praises? We have any praises this week? Our truck showed up. Sure. We yeah. have furniture. Amen. And before the sure. rain. And before the rain. That's right. Absolutely. God is good. Well, let's go to him and pray together. God, thank you for today. Lord, we pray for these requests. God, we pray for Kennedy right now, Lord, that you would touch her, um, that you would help her to feel better. Um, God, that you would help her to take a nap today. Um, that would be awesome. Lord, we pray for Tom. God, as he and many others, Lord, that we know are so discouraged right now. God, that you would surround them with your peace and your comfort and your love and let them know that they're not alone. God, they're not left out. Um, Lord, we thank you for the great things that have happened this week. God, I thank you so much for stuff that we take for granted so easy. And most of what we probably don't need, God, but we thank you for the blessing of beds and furniture. Um, God, we thank you for being a part of this community. Lord, we thank you for our awesome worship team and the great teachers we have for our Sunday school classes and for our kids. And, um, Lord, we just give you today. God, it's your day. Use it how you see fit. We love you, Lord. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Before we 
we uh, look at our Bible passage for today, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just ask that you would be with us today as we study your word. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, would be active among us today. Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to hear. Lord, we ask that um, we would read your word and that we would be changed. That it would be living and active in our lives and that we would be guided and led by it. God, we give you this morning. We just thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bible today, we're going to be um, in Mark chapter 8. Um, we're not going to read from it for a minute, so I'll give you some time to get there if you would like. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. So just a little bit of background. At this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' ministry is in full swing. So he has started um, to do things publicly. He has been healing people. He has been sharing parables. At this point, he has already calmed the sea. He has walked on water. And he has even raised a dead girl to life. So Jesus' power has been available and on display for those who are willing to have faith and accept it. In fact, in, in the book of Mark, we see that he was so powerful that even those who had faith and touched the hem of his garment were healed. But he's also shaking things up a little bit. Jesus was countercultural, right? He, he didn't fit necessarily the norm. He did things that made people kind of go. And so he started to raise some eyebrows. You see, he healed on the Sabbath. He touched people that were deemed unclean. He even said it was okay for his disciples to eat with unclean hands on one occasion. So as you can imagine, he's starting to shake things up a little bit. He's starting to say and do some things that are raising some questions. But he's also doing awesome things, miraculous things, wonderful things. And so when we get to this passage today in Mark chapter 8, Jesus has just <coughs> fed 4,000 people. Now, just to clarify, this is a separate event from the feeding of the 5,000. In the Gospel of Mark, you actually get accounts of both. So first, Jesus feeds the 5,000, and the people who were there were primarily Jewish. But in Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds a group of about 4,000 people, actually probably more, because that was probably only the men, right? So it was actually multiplied by two or three. And What's really interesting about this time is that when Jesus feeds the 4,000, those people are not Jews. They are actually Gentiles, which is a big deal. Part of what Mark focuses on in his gospel is the inclusiveness of what Jesus has come to do. That Jesus has come, that he has come for all people, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. So when Jesus feeds the 5,000, you know, he takes the bread and the fish, and there's enough for everybody. In fact, there's more than enough. There's 12 baskets left over, and I'm kind of nerving out on you for just a second. For a Jewish listener, they would have known, oh, 12, and it would have reminded them of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this time, Jesus feeds 4,000 people, and there are seven baskets left over. And the number seven in the Bible is very important, and it kind of signifies wholeness or completion. And so it's very significant, first of all, that he was doing this with a group of Gentiles, but also that there were seven baskets left over. And it kind of signifies that this is where the wholeness is. That the wholeness of what Christ has come to do is not just for Jews, but it is for everyone. It is for Jews and Gentiles, for everyone. And so... Perhaps because of this instance, when we pick up in verse 11, the Pharisees, who are Jewish leaders, are coming to Jesus, and this is kind of how they respond. So it says this in verse 11. It says, The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. So the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. 
Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another, and they said, It's because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you still talking about having no bread? Do you not still see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears that fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? So the account we're reading today, it starts out with an instance where the Pharisees are confronting Jesus. The Pharisees confront Jesus, and then there's afterwards there's a situation with the disciples, and they're connected, okay? And so I find it really interesting that the Pharisees ask for a sign from heaven. And, and that whenever they do, Jesus' response is, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given. That's really interesting to me. You know, they say that hindsight is 2020, but from our perspective, I mean, Jesus just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. I think you could consider that a sign. So it's interesting to me that they're asking him for a sign. At this point, he has healed a deaf man. He has healed a blind man. He healed a woman who had been bleeding for years. He raised Jairus' daughter from death to life. And yet, to test him, the Pharisees ask for a sign from heaven. So when Jesus says that no sign will be given to that generation, it's not because he's not willing to do things that only God can do. Because he's been doing them for a while now. But it's, the evidence is already in front of their faces and they're not seeing it. Or maybe the sign is contrary to what they wanted, so they refused to accept it. Because the Pharisees and, and the Jewish people of the day, they had a very clear expectation of what they thought the Messiah would come and do. And so they're testing and they're asking for a sign from heaven. So after this little encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus and the disciples get back in the boat. You know, as you read through the Gospels, it's amazing how much time Jesus spends getting on and off a boat. That's kind of how they traveled. They would, they would get in the boat, and then they would go on shore, they would talk to people, they would heal people, they would feed people, they would get back in the boat. It's kind of like if you were um, doing like a evangelism ministry, and you drove from town to town to share what Christ had done. They did that by boat. So Jesus and his disciples, they spend quite a lot of time on boats. But they have a predicament, which is that the disciples this time have forgotten to bring bread, except for the one loaf that's on the boat. And so we're halfway through the book of Mark, and this is already the third time that you have a situation where you have a lack of bread. And so Jesus begins to speak, and he says, Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Whenever I saw that this was a preaching passage for the week, I kind of like groaned because I read it and I was like, oh, the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, like, what does that even mean? Like, that is not an easy thing to preach on. Couldn't it be like a parable or like a fun story? But he says, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And so when the disciples hear this, they take it very literally. They think he's talking about actual bread. They think maybe he's kind of getting on to them because they didn't bring their bread. But Jesus has already demonstrated that he really doesn't need all that much bread, right? So they think it has to do with literal bread, but Jesus is talking about figurative bread. And so Jesus reminds them of what he has already done. Twice already he has taken food and he has multiplied. And not only did he multiply it, but there was bread left over. And Jesus asked them to remember how much bread was left over. Not only because it's important that Jesus was able to multiply the bread, 
or that he was able to feed the people, but that there was bread left over, that there was an abundance, that there was more than enough. So personally, I love bread. I really love bread. I love, you know, just plain old white bread. I really love tortillas. I love a good rye bread with some butter. Or if you go to a restaurant and you get some biscuits with honey on them. I love anything bread related. In fact, Tyler will make fun of me often because sometimes whenever I want a snack, I'll just go get a piece of bread or a tortilla. Tortillas are my weakness. I don't know what it is. Got a stomach ache, eat a tortilla. Feeling blue, eat a tortilla. I don't know what it is. It's really weird, but I love tortillas. And so I love bread. And I've been very, very blessed in my life that I've never been in a situation where this staple, bread, has been unavailable to me. I've been very blessed to always been able to just go and get bread. And I'd always taken bread for granted until about a year ago, <laughs> right? So ironically, I think it's maybe today or yesterday, For it, it kind of happened differently across the US, but we were out in California at the time and I had a picture show up on my Amazon memories, and it was a picture of a shopping cart. And at first I thought, why did I take a picture of my shopping cart? And then I realized, oh, I know what happened a year ago, right? What happened a year ago? The stores were empty. The stores were empty. Yeah, we officially entered into pandemic life, right? So a year ago, um, our lives changed drastically, and I'm sure that yours did too. So for Tyler and I, um, it was just a weird time. We had just moved to California maybe six weeks before that, and so we were still getting used to everything. We moved away from our families. Uh, when we moved out, we didn't know anybody except for who we had interviewed with, and uh, they were so wonderful to us, such a blessing to us. Um, and Tyler started working right away, but we didn't know anyone, so I, I waited a little bit. We wanted to find childcare for Kennedy, and so I waited until March to start working at the church. And I got to have one Sunday as a pastor at Visalia Nazarene in the building. And that's it. Still, have, still haven't had another one. And so um, we had no idea when we moved out there um, what was going to be ahead. And to top it all off, when we were loading our moving truck to um, go out there, I found out I was pregnant. So, so we find out we're pregnant, we move to California, we're there for not very long, and suddenly the pandemic hits. And so we're at church, and um, our lead pastor and his wife, they had taken a couple days away. They really needed it. Um, and so if you want someone to look to to blame for COVID, you should definitely blame our pastor because we all know that something bad always happens when the lead pastor goes away, right? It just, it's just how it works. So they went away for a couple days. We were all just, you know, in La La Land, none the wiser. And finally, you know, things are going on in the news. We're in California, so they were already talking about, suddenly talking about stay-at-home orders. And our pastor and, and uh, his wife, who is also a pastor, they called in. We have this big powwow, and we decide that we're going to have services online that week. And then we start getting phone calls from the community, right? So when I really started to take it serious was when we got a phone call from someone at the school that says, hey, they're, they're going to be closing down the schools. So then it's like, okay, the alarm bells start going off, like, hey, something is really going on. And so we were incredibly level-headed, and we did what every level-headed American did at the time, and we went to the store. And I have a picture of our shopping cart, and we were very lucky because we did have a little bit of advance notice before everybody else, and so we got there before most people were running there and getting stuff. And so we got our cart, and um, we had an 18-month-old at the time, and so um, for us, our cart looked like a lot of applesauce and goldfish and diapers and wipes and coloring books because we thought we were about to lose our child care and we did and we thought we were going to be trapped at home in our tiny, tiny apartment with a tiny tornado. So we're like getting stuff from the dollar aisle, you know, how do we keep her busy and active? We don't have a yard. And I have, I took a picture of our shopping cart 
And I remember frying a few loaves of what? Bread. Bread. Because in my head I thought, okay, if we're in this for a while, we can freeze them. And I am not a baker. I would love to be a baker, but you would not want to eat my bread, okay? And so we bought some bread. And so the thing is, is I think at the time, none of us really knew what was coming our way. I think we were all blissfully ignorant to what was headed our way. And certain things started to become more valuable, right? Hand sanitizer, toilet paper. I remember one of um, our bookkeeper on staff, she went somewhere and they had toilet paper and it was like four rolls for, I mean, an outrageous price. And she like bought it and she brought each of our staff members four rolls of toilet paper. And it was so kind of her. You know, so things that we take for granted for a little while, we were not taking them for granted, right? And one of those things was bread. And so it got to a point for a while, for quite a while, where when you went to the store, you couldn't buy bread, you couldn't buy flour, you couldn't buy yeast. And that's partially because more and more people during the pandemic started to bake their own bread. Especially in quarantine, a lot of people started, it became almost trendy, right, to bake your own bread. And one thing you need for bread is what? Yeast. Yes. So yeast is a single cell fungi. It feeds on sugars to survive, so it feeds on the sugar, it eats the sugar, and then it burps out carbon dioxide, and that is what causes bread to rise, okay? I kind of thought if you had an episode of Magic School Bus, you know, what would yeast look like, right? So it, it eats the sugar, it lets out the carbon dioxide, and then it causes bread to rise. And there's lots of different types of yeast, some can cause infections, some help with fermentation, and some you bake in your bread. And so yeast has been used by um, people to make bread for centuries. And so bread is filling. It's comforting. I think carbs are very comforting. And it makes us feel full. So what did Jesus mean then when he was warning the disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees so what Jesus is doing is he is comparing the way of the Pharisees and Herod to his way. Jesus refers to himself in the Gospels as the bread of life. And so what's the difference between bread that is made of this worldly yeast versus the bread that is made of godly yeast? See, the way of the Pharisees and the way of Herod will not sustain you. It will not give you life. And even though there are no Pharisees today, and King Herod is no longer alive or in power, the ingredients of these ways of thinking are still prevalent today. So first let's look at the yeast of the Pharisees. The way of the Pharisees was the way of the law. Now, the law in and of itself was not bad. The law in and of itself was given by God to be a good the same for the Pharisees. I think sometimes when we read the Bible, it is really easy to make the Pharisees the villains. But I think at least at first they had good intent. Because what they did is they took the law that God had given, a law that was meant to set God's people apart, and they had questions about it. Rightfully so. Okay, God's given us this law. We're to live it out. How do we do that? And so their response to that, what happened is people started adding like this extra stuff, right? So you have a commandment, but let's add these extra kind of like rules, these extra do's and don'ts that will help us to live out what God has asked us to do. So it's really not a negative thing in and of itself, probably not a negative thing in intent, but what happened is they got so wrapped up in how do we live the law, that they started to overlook, how do we love like the law wants us to love, right? So how do, how do we do instead of how do we be? And so um, it was probably from good intentions at first, but the living of the law had started to overshadow the loving of the law. And so um, they become more focused on who is in, who is out. to keep his power. 
fact, he was so desperate to keep his power and his control over his land that he even killed his own sons so that he could keep that power. It's a mentality um, of scarcity, of what can I do to keep what I have? This is like the buy a closet full of toilet paper mentality, right? So the way of Herod is the way of so then after this morning, Jesus reminds them of what he has recently done, the miracles with the bread, and he asks them, do you not still understand? See, Jesus is uh, reminding the disciples that the way of the Pharisees, the way of Herod, reproduces, it expands, and those ideas can spread so easily, even among Christ's followers, even among so the thing about yeast is that it has to be activated. Yeast becomes activated with warm water and it's food, sugar. And yeast is only fruitful when it is fed. And Jesus is saying, be careful what yeast you allow to be activated in your life. See, when he reminds the disciples what he's done, of the miracles he's done, he's reminding them of the alternative, the way of the Lord different way of thinking, of doing, of being, that can change a person and a people. You see, unlike the Pharisees, God's way is graceful and merciful. When Jesus touched people, it did not make him unclean. First of all, it was revolutionary that he even touched those people. And then that it did not make him unclean, but rather he made them God's way is full of grace and mercy, and even those with the stench of death are not without hope. God's way is also inclusive. Mark's gospel has a miracle of bread to the Jews and a miracle of bread to the Gentiles, because the grace of God is extended to all who will receive it. It's not focused on who's in and out, not focused on who's clean or unclean, but instead it says, Hey, there's a seat at this table for you, and our guest of honor, Jesus, he will even wash your feet. You see, unlike Herod, God's way is plentiful. There are no shortages in the kingdom of God. We will not be wanting for bread or for toilet paper. But the way of God is provision in abundance. The way of God is not about trying to keep what is mine but about passing around the basket so that everybody can have some. See, in the kingdom of God, not only is there enough for you and for me, but there is enough for all. And so Jesus has this conversation with the disciples, and it gives us a reminder today that no man-made kingdom can sustain us. No man-made kingdom can give us life. Only the kingdom of God can. So don't look up to the two things we often get so caught up in, religious legalism or political power. But instead, we look to the one who is able to multiply life. Keep kingdom eyes instead of worldly eyes, which is hard sometimes. It's hard, especially right now. I look at the world, and you know what I want? I want a solution. I want to say, okay, if we would just do this, then things would be better. And I want a solution that's in my control, right? I think that's why sometimes religious legalism is so easy to slip into because we want something that is tangible, that is in control, or we want a political ideal or a political person or some sort of power that is going to fix it. It is harder to look at a few loaves of bread and entrust them to Jesus and know that there's going to be it takes faith. It takes faith. So we must keep kingdom eyes instead of worldly eyes. And what do worldly eyes do? They cloud our vision and our memory. They narrow our perspective so that we get overly focused on what a good Christian should look like instead of pulling up that seat to the table. Worldly eyes tell us that people should have to behave in order to 
Worldly eyes often fixate on what we lack while forgetting the abundance that is found in Jesus. And worldly eyes turn to worldly powers to save us and lead us instead of to the true and eternal King. Maybe you've heard the term, food is fuel. So let me ask you today, what are you feeding? Where are you turning for sustenance? So we're a people of bread. That's a staple for us. The question is, whose bread are we using to nourish us? Is it the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod? The yeast of legalism, of power, of fear, of control? Or are we feasting on the abundant bread of life? See, bread is what Jesus chose to use to represent his body to the world. Right? When, as we journey towards the cross, we're going to see that in his last supper with his disciples, Jesus chose bread to signify his body, to become a symbol of hope and of grace. And when Jesus multiplies the bread, or when he talks about himself as living bread, it all points to the cross. So for the disciples, it foreshadows the breaking of bread before the breaking of Christ's body. And for us, as people who observe communion, it's a reminder of God's love, God's grace, and his mercy demonstrated on the cross in an anticipation of his coming again. Sometimes in the midst of fear, fear of the unknown, fear of um, having enough, fear of just all those things that we can get wrapped up in this world, we can often forget that there is enough. And even if God has provided for us time and time again, do we forget that he has already demonstrated to us who he is? The disciples only had one loaf of bread, and there was 12 of them. Jesus has just fed 4,000 people with a few loaves of bread. And yet they're sitting in the boat and they're worried that he's going to be upset that they forgot bread. Sometimes I do that in my own life. I, I'm facing a situation, I'm facing a season, and I think, oh man, can God really enter into this? Can God really make a difference in this? And then so, sometimes the Holy Spirit is like, do you not remember what I have done for you? Do you not remember what I have always done for you? these times in your life that I have been there, what makes you think I'm going to stop now? What makes you think that the Jesus who can multiply bread twice already couldn't do it again? So may we not be a people who have eyes that fail to see or ears that fail to hear, but instead may we feast upon the living bread. One thing that Lent is known for is a time of fasting, which is very, very good. And, but in Lent, there's also a time of feasting. And so as we continue through Lent, may we do both. May we fast, but may we also feast, sometimes on literal bread, but also on the living bread. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just are so grateful for you, Lord. God, that you humbled yourself, came as a man. Christ, that you lived among us, that you performed miracle after miracle. And Lord, we are so grateful that you are so patient with us. God, that even when we forget, use your word use your church, God, to remind us of what, we, what you have already done. God, remind us that you have always been faithful and you will continue to be faithful. Lord, we are grateful to you that in you there is abundance, that in you, that you are more than enough. And God, we, we just want to honor you. We want to live in a way that shows others who you are. So God, I just pray that this week you would help us to rest in that, that we would rest in your way, not the way of the Pharisees or of Herod or of this, this world around us, 
but God, that we would rest in you. Lord, use your spirit to give us the strength to do that. We love you so much. In Jesus' name.